Gertrude Hullis had been depressed since her husband had died unexpectedly four months earlier. Her GP, Dr. Adams, was very attentive to her, as he had been to her late husband and to his many other wealthy patients in Eastbourne. He personally gave Mrs. Hullet the dosage of sodium barbitone which he had prescribed for her each morning. Mrs. Hullet must have been very grateful to him for the care and attention she received, because she wrote a cheque out to him for £1,000 on the 17th of July. This was rather a large sum of money in 1956, and Dr. Adams was anxious to have it cleared by the bank as soon as possible, because he requested of his bank manager that it be cleared in one day rather than the usual seven days. This was fortunate for Dr. Adams, as it turned out, because the following day Mrs. Hullett took an overdose of sodium barbitone and fell into a coma. A different doctor attended her, a Dr. Harris, and Dr. Adams joined him as soon as he heard of the matter. It must have slipped Dr. Adams' mind either that Mrs. Hullett was depressed or that she was on barbiturates, which he himself had prescribed for her, because he failed to mention this to Dr. Harris. The two doctors conferred and decided that Mrs. Hullett had succumbed to cerebral hemorrhage. The pathologist who came to collect samples from the woman inquired as to whether or not he should take a stomach sample to guard against the possibility of narcotic poisoning. Both doctors declared this to be quite unnecessary. It seems that Dr. Adams was always thinking ahead, because although Mrs. Hullett was still alive and could have been treated with an antidote, he contacted the coroner and made an appointment for a post-mortem to be held in her name. Dr. Adams was correct in his prognosis, as it happens, because Mrs. Hullett developed bronchopneumonia, and she died on the 23rd of July, 1956. A post-mortem was duly held, and large quantities of sodium barbitone were found in her body, and an inquest was held on the 21st of August, at which the coroner was not quite so admiring of Dr. Adams and his care as many of his patients seemed to be. He said he found it extraordinary that Dr. Adams had not immediately suspected barbiturate poisoning, and especially in view of Mrs. Hullett's history. Nevertheless, he entered a verdict of suicide. Whatever disappointment Dr. Adams may have felt at the coroner's criticism, it was doubtless lessened by the fact that it turned out that Mrs. Hullett had left him her Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn in a will written just five days before her death. At the time of Mrs. Hullett's death, the coroner's comments caused something of a stir in Eastbourne. There had been rumours for a number of years concerning Dr. Adams and his medical practice. The fact that he had received some 132 bequests in the wills of his patients, which had apparently made him the wealthiest GP in England, may have had something to do with it. On the day that Mrs. Hullett died, the police received an anonymous phone call, which alerted them to the circumstances of her death, and the matter was passed to Superintendent Hannam of Scotland Yard. On looking into the matter, Superintendent Hannam discovered many complaints concerning Dr. Adams' treatment of patients who had died in recent years, his role in their demise, and the large bequests he commonly received from them. The circumstances clearly warranted a full investigation. John Bodkin Adams was born in Randallstown in Northern Ireland in 1899. His family were members of an austere Protestant religious sect known as the Plymouth Brethren, in which his father was a preacher. He had a brother, William, but both his brother and father died when Adams was in his teens. Adams attended Queen's University, Belfast, and graduated at the age of 22 without honours. He spent an unsuccessful year at Bristol Royal Infirmary as a houseman, and thereafter, at the age of 23, he joined a Christian medical practice in Eastbourne, Sussex. His mother joined him there, and in 1929, with the help of a wealthy patient, Adams bought Kent Lodge in Seaside Road in Eastbourne, where he lived and ran his medical practice thereafter. Adams was somewhat shunned by other Eastbourne doctors. He was, in any case, something of a loner, but after a wealthy patient named Matilda Whitten, 
died and left him seven and a half thousand pounds in her will in 1935. That's approximately half a million pounds in today's money. Tongues began to wag. By the time of Mrs. Hullett's death, which had sparked the police investigations, Dr. Adams had been in practice for some 34 years, and during that period he had had a large number of patients and had, quite naturally, issued many death certificates. Hannum therefore decided to examine those issued in the past 10 years, during the period from 1946 to 1956, and he passed these to a Home Office pathologist, Francis Camps. Camps decided that a total of 163 of these should be considered suspicious. The investigation began to take statements from nurses and medical staff, and a number of these claimed that when administering his special injections, Dr. Adams frequently insisted that they leave the room during the procedure. Others said he sought to isolate patients from their relatives during their final days, would lock the door while visiting them, pocketed items of value following a patient's death, or simply requested such items, declaring that the deceased had promised them to him. He also invoiced the estates of his deceased patients for large sums of money, based on unusually large numbers of visits he had made. Superintendent Hannum's attention was drawn to the case of a Mrs. Morell, who had suffered a stroke in 1948 and had been released from hospital into the care of Dr. Adams on transferal to her home in Eastbourne. He had prescribed her morphine and later diamorphine, or heroin, and her condition deteriorated until she died in November of 1950. She was 81 years of age, and her death attracted little attention in view of this fact. But Hannam noticed that she had left Adams her Rolls-Royce silver ghost, a chest of silver cutlery, and a large cash bequest, although a codicil had subsequently cut him out of her will. Nevertheless, Adams billed her estate for an astonishing 1,100 visits at a cost of some £1,654. This implied that he had visited her three times each day during the time he had attended her. A post-mortem was averted by Adams declaring, as he often did, that he had no financial interest in the matter of her death, and there were no circumstances that warranted one. The case of Mrs. Morell was eight years old by the time Scotland Yard investigated the matter, and unfortunately she had been cremated on Adam's instructions, which meant it would be extremely difficult to prove wrongdoing by Adam's, other than by purely circumstantial means. Meanwhile, the rumours of Dr. Adam's role in the deaths of many of his patients had reached the ears of the press. Fleet Street buzzed with the story, but nothing was published while the police investigation continued. But a poem was widely circulated at the time, which summed up the general feeling. In Eastbourne it is healthy, and the residents are wealthy. It's a miracle that anybody dies. Yet this pearl of English Lido's is a slaughterhouse of widows, if their bankrolls are above the normal size, if they're lucky in addition in their choice of a physician and remember him when making out their wills, and bequeath their Rolls Royces, then they soon hear angels' voices, and are quickly freed from all their earthly ills. Hannum was convinced that he could make a case against Adams, and he decided to interview doctors who had worked with him or been associated with him. Then an extraordinary thing happened. The British Medical Association, BMA, sent a letter to all Eastbourne doctors reminding them of their duty of confidentiality if interviewed by the police. Hannum was outraged as doctor-patient confidentiality applied only to living patients. This was an obvious attempt by the BMA to obstruct the police investigation by discouraging doctors from speaking to the police. He took the matter to the Attorney General, Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, who wrote to the BMA asking them to revoke the letter. The BMA would not be moved on this, until Manning and Buller met with the secretary of the BMA, McRae, and, quite astonishingly, 
pass the confidential 187-page police report on Dr. Adams to him. McRae passed it to the BMA president, and it was copied and seen by a number of people. There is little doubt that Dr. Adams had access to this report, and his defence team at trial possessed a copy. Superintendent Hannam got wind of the leaking of his report and was furious. He recognised that the medical establishment was attempting to frustrate his investigation, and it is almost certain that it was he who leaked the matter, because on the 28th of November two Labour MPs gave notice of questions relating to what reports the Attorney General had sent to the General Medical Council, GMC, in the past six months. Manning and Buller obfuscated and denied that he had had any contact with the GMC, only with an individual. This was not strictly true, but it satisfied the MPs. The BMA, under considerable pressure, agreed to revoke its order of silence to Eastbourne doctors. But Hannam was dismayed that only two doctors, in the end, were prepared to give any evidence on the matter of Dr. Adams. But Hannam didn't give up. He contrived a brief interview with Dr. Adams, who clearly knew all about his investigation, but Adams merely expressed surprise at the matter under investigation and smoothly dismissed it. Hannam then obtained a warrant and conducted a search of Adams' house, looking specifically for narcotic drugs. Adams fielded all questions confidently, with an air of perplexed, mild surprise, and indicated that he kept no dangerous drugs register, or any other records. But he was seen to slip two bottles into his pocket during the search, and he was challenged on these. Both were prescriptions for morphine, for patients who had died. Hannam arrested Adams and charged him with falsifying cremation records but it was not sufficient to hold him in custody, and he was released on bail. A month later, Hannam decided he had gathered sufficient evidence to charge Adams with four deaths, including those of Gertrude Hullett and Edith Morell. He submitted the evidence for the four cases to the Crown Prosecution Service, and was surprised when the case selected as the lead case to commit to trial was that of Edith Morell. The case was eight years old. Her body had been cremated and she was 81 years old at the time of her death. On the face of it, Dr. Adams had simply administered powerful narcotic painkillers to a seriously elderly lady, and there was little evidence against him. When told of the charges against him, Adams said, Murder? Murder? Can you prove it was murder? I didn't think you could prove it was murder. She was dying in any event. It is difficult to argue with Adam's assessment here. Mrs. Morell had had a stroke, and she was not going to get better, and she was 81 years old. Hannam was fully aware that pinning the hopes of a successful prosecution on such a weak case was going to be a struggle. The evidence he had amassed was broad and systematic in nature and related to a large number of cases which appeared to have greater foundation when considered in depth than that of Mrs. Morell. It has been argued that the Attorney General thought that Edith Morell offered the best chance of conviction because her death was unnatural, that Adams had administered or could have administered a lethal dose of the drug, and that Adams had motive for killing her. In any case, Adams was charged with the murder of Edith Morell, and the prosecution cited the deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Hullett in evidence of system which would be taken at the trial. It was not a promising start to the proceedings against Dr. Bodkin Adams, and when the chairman of the magistrate, Sir Roland Gwynne, was obliged to step down to the committal proceedings, as he was a friend of Dr. Adams, it revealed the extent to which Adams was well connected and had friends in high places. Sir Roland Gwynne was, in fact, more than a mere friend of Adam's. He was his long-standing lover, and the two holidayed together regularly, often in the company of the Deputy Chief Constable of Police of Eastbourne, Alexander Seekings. The trial was further hampered when key prosecution evidence went missing. 
A cheque for £1,000 received by Adams was regarded as a crucial piece of evidence, but it vanished, and it is believed that this was removed by the Deputy Chief Constable Seekings, who was, of course, also Adams' lover. It was also at this time that Lord Goddard, the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, and Head of the Judiciary, was seen dining with Sir Roland Gwynne, Adams' lover, and with Sir Hartley Shawcross, the previous Attorney General, at the White Hart Hotel in Lewes. The impropriety of this was astonishing, and although nothing is known of their reason for the meeting, or what was discussed, given the circumstances of the trial, and what had preceded the meeting and what came after it, it leaves little doubt as to its purpose. Lord Goddard called the trial judge Devlin afterwards, whom he himself had appointed to preside in the trial, and he suggested that Adam should be released on bail if he was not found guilty of the first charge, even though other cases against him were outstanding. This was the first time in British legal history that this had happened, and it demonstrates the measure of Adam's influence and connections. Devlin was surprised, as he made clear many years later, but he agreed to the suggestion. Devlin himself was highly ambitious, and he wished to become Lord Chief Justice one day, as Goddard well knew. The trial of Dr. Adams began on the 18th of March 1957 at the Old Bailey. It involved a great deal of expert testimony by its nature. The prosecution witnesses proved reticent in the matter of whether or not murder had been committed, and defence witnesses were adamant that although Adams' treatment was unusual, it could not be considered to be murder. The defence did not call Adams to give testimony, or to be cross-examined, which dismayed the prosecution, and even the judge was surprised because it was their hope that the loquacious doctor would incriminate himself during cross-examination. The trial examined the case of Mrs. Morell, heard a great deal of expert testimony from forensic and toxicology experts, also from nurses, friends and acquaintances of patients, and in spite of a wealth of suspicious circumstances, the judge, Devlin, concluded that the evidence was not sufficient. The jury accordingly considered the matter for a very short time and found Dr. Adams not guilty. The other charges against Dr. Adams relating to Mr. and Mrs. Hullett were dropped by the Attorney General, which the trial judge Devlin later called an abusive process and led to questions being asked in Parliament about the handling of the trial. There was a great deal of public disquiet over the acquittal of Dr. Adams and he was widely and generally considered to be guilty. Although the case against Dr. Adams was insufficient, mishandled, dogged by leaks, by losses of evidence, and by the efforts and incompetence of those involved in the justice system, there was little doubt in the mind of the public and press that Adams was guilty. There has been much discussion of the case in the intervening years, and Dr. Adams has frequently been defended and regarded with a degree of sympathy by those in the legal fraternity and medical profession. That changed in 2003. A curious circumstance, again demonstrating the reach and influence of Adams and the nature and extent of his connections, was the sealing of the prosecution and police files on Adams until the year 2033. Given that Adams was in his late fifties at the time of the trial in 1957, it was surprising that the papers were sealed for 75 years. However, by special application of a historian, Pamela Cullen, the papers were released in 2003, and the full extent of Dr. Adams' activities became known. These provided an extensive catalogue of wrongdoing by Adams, which supplemented the evidence of the 1957 trial, leaving little doubt as to Adams' guilt. There were many cases in which Adams had injected patients for no apparent reason. He had administered hypnotic drugs, causing disorientation. Cases of theft from patients were common. 
There were also cases in which he had prevented patients from seeing their relatives in their final days, and in which he had been witnessed coercing them into altering their wills in his favour. A nurse had given evidence that she was certain that Adams had given the wrong drug to a patient immediately prior to their death, and that he had subsequently benefited in their will. Adams had acquired 5,000 phenobarbitone tablets, and used them all, and there were myriad cases of individuals whom Adams stood accused of dispatching for his own financial gain. Adams had treated a woman named Julia Bradnam, who appeared to be in good health. He induced her to make changes to her will. On the next morning, she said she felt unwell. Adams gave her an injection, and she died within minutes. He had said to the nurse on this occasion, It will all be over in three minutes. Indeed it was. Adams gave her cause of death a cerebral hemorrhage on her death certificate. On exhumation, the pathologist declared this to be incorrect, but given the condition of the body, could not determine the true cause of death. A woman named Julia Thomas had been given medication by Adams. He told her cook she had given him her typewriter, and he took it. She died hours later. Two elderly sisters, Hilda Neal Miller and Clara Neal Miller, were patients of Dr. Adams. Neither had received any mail for months, and Adams was seen pocketing articles by their nurse on his visits. He arranged Hilda's funeral after her death. Apparently Adams locked the door when visiting her sister Clara, and a nurse was shocked to see her on one occasion lying on the bed with her nightdress pulled up to her chest with the windows fully open in February, and Adams sitting reading the Bible to her. On another occasion she sat on his knee, and she told a friend she found his fat hands on her comforting. Her friend said she appeared to be under the influence of drugs. She died of bronchopneumonia and left Adams £1,275, and in addition he charged her estate £700 for visits. The guest house owner, where both sisters died, Annie Shah, was interviewed by the police, and Hannam believed she was about to tell them all about Adams. However, Adams diagnosed Annie Sharp with cancer. He gave her very large doses of pethidine, and she died five days later. Adams issued a death certificate, and had her cremated before Hannam was even aware of it. It was another blow for the investigation. Another patient, James Downs, was in a nursing home. He suffered with dementia, and Adams treated him with morphia for a broken leg. He called a solicitor, had Downs pronounced to be of sound mind, had Downs changed his will, leaving Adams £1,000, and Downs died within 12 hours of Adams' final visit. Alfred Hullett, the husband of Gertrude Hullett, died of a heart attack after receiving morphine from Adams. Adams visited the chemist immediately after his death, asking for a backdated morphine prescription. He received £500 in Hullett's will. All this and much more begs the question, why was Adams found not guilty? The case against Adams was always going to be difficult to prosecute successfully. His patients were elderly, they had many real ailments, often serious ones, and the practice of doctors treating terminally ill patients with powerful drugs, which may hasten death, is well established as something the law forbids but ignores in practice. This certainly caused Adams to be seen by some people prior to 2003 and the release of the sealed papers as someone who was a mercy killer, who ended his patients' lives with good intentions, but whose avariciousness and greed brought his motives into question. But this is inaccurate. It was apparent in 1957, and has become shockingly so since 2003, that Adams was killing people without any due regard for their well-being or the state of their health. The nursing home owner was diagnosed and died within five days, but it is doubtful whether she had any serious illness whatever. She had become a threat to him, and he dealt with her ruthlessly, 
and disposed of her body by cremation, to ensure that nothing could ever be known of his diagnosis, of his treatment, or of her cause of death. That the patients he dispatched were usually elderly was not a matter of mercy on his part, but of the clear advantage accruing to him that such deaths in this age group would more readily be accepted without the need of further inquiry or post-mortem. Adams did not alleviate suffering. His prescription was death. The difficulty Superintendent Hannam and his detectives had in proving that Adams was a murderer was due to a number of factors. Motive was strong, and Adams benefiting from the deaths of such a large number of his patients, with much circumstantial evidence to accuse him, seemed to provide an excellent basis for prosecution. But it wasn't enough. The existence of bequests alone, whilst providing motive for murder, does not of itself provide proof of execution. The fact of his avariciousness and greed was well established, but it could not provide intention. The case against Dr. Adams failed in this respect. It was made especially problematic by the fact that his patients were usually elderly. They were usually ill, depressed, or suffering from a serious medical condition. The diagnosis of the patient's physical condition had usually been made by Adams himself, and in the cases where his diagnosis had been proved incorrect, this could be attributed to incompetence, rather than to a deliberate attempt to create a condition which would justify the administration of powerful drugs. Dr. Adams frequently controlled other aspects of his patients' lives, their access to other medical professions, their families and friends, and frequently he was their sole executor, responsible for their burial or cremation. He was the signatory of their death certificate, and therefore indicated the cause of death, and was able to control, to an extent, whether or not a post-mortem was held. Many of his patients were cremated quickly after their death, thus preventing exhumations and subsequent inquiries or any second guessing of his diagnosis. Dr. Adams was also assisted in his acquittal by other factors too. He had powerful friends, in particular Sir Roland Gwynne, his lover, the Deputy Chief Constable Seekings, who obligingly disappeared evidence. The Chief Constable of Eastbourne himself, was Adam's patient and friend, and the Lord Chief Justice, Rainer Goddard, and many others. Adams also benefited from a lack of clarity on rules concerning end-of-life treatment for patients, and the reluctance of the medical profession and political authorities to legislate for such matters, meaning Adams could take advantage of such lack of clarity. The extraordinary trust given to doctors by authorities and society served him well. The medical fraternity closed ranks and were very opposed to a doctor being prosecuted for the administration of drugs. The use of powerful drugs to alleviate suffering in terminal cases was and is common practice and the successful prosecution of a doctor for administering such drugs could have exposed doctors generally to the risk of prosecution. The National Health Service, NHS, was in its infancy and struggling. It could not be allowed to fail. Doctors might abandon the service or the profession. The hanging of an NHS doctor for treating a patient might even cause public panic and undermine the health service. The Macmillan government was hanging by a thread following the resignation of Prime Minister Anthony Eden after Suez, and another crisis would almost certainly have brought down the government. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan had another personal reason for protecting Adams. Adams was the doctor of Macmillan's brother-in-law, the Duke of Devonshire, who had himself died in Adams' care. Macmillan's wife, the Duke's sister, was having an affair at the time with the Conservative peer Robert Boothby. The circumstances surrounding the Duke's death were highly suspicious. Adams not only treated the Duke, but was present when he died, suddenly and unexpectedly. And he signed his death certificate. 
the incident would not bear too close an inspection. The Attorney General, Manning and Buller, regularly attended Macmillan's cabinet. He was very well aware of the Duke of Devonshire, Macmillan's wife, and Robert Boothby Triangle, as well, of course, of Adam's involvement. Finally, Adams benefited from the presumption by the prosecution, the press and the public that greed alone was his motive. Like Shipman, Adams had gained financially from the deaths of his patients. He had fraudulently obtained drugs and had administered them inappropriately. He was thoroughly dishonest, clearly a thief, and monetary advantage was certainly a motive. But as with Shipman, there was a more powerful psychological imperative which concerned a certain fascination with death, the feeling of power in its administration by him, and a curious perverse excitement in procuring it. Adams was frequently present at the time of death, doubtless in part to be on hand to swiftly cover his tracks, sign off paperwork and make funeral arrangements and for the disposal of their assets but it is also clear he felt an empowerment in being there at the end of a patient's life by his own design, which was a significant motive. This was a motive not fully understood or recognized at that time. In addition to all of this, the prosecution had to prove intention to kill, that death was a direct result of actions taken by Adams as the chief causative factor, and that Adams had administered the cause of death. This was extraordinarily difficult to prove, because Adams was a doctor, and his patients were elderly and often ill. It is presumably the reason why only one doctor in British history has ever been successfully prosecuted for the death of a patient, Harold Shipman. That is because doctors deal with the end of patients' lives every day. The intention to kill is difficult to prove in the case of a doctor because it depends to a degree on the actions taken by the individual. If a lay person administered morphine to another person and it resulted in their death, it would offer evidence of intention since it would naturally reflect on their procurement of the drug, its possession, and provide a reasonable supposition that harm might accrue from its administration. In the case of a doctor, the drug is available to him as a treatment, and its administration to a patient is dependent on the doctor's expertise and knowledge of a patient and of their illness. This is a subjective factor in judging its effects. Thus, intention to kill is difficult to prove in the case of a doctor treating a patient with a drug available to him as a treatment. If the patient has a pre-existing condition, then the problem of directing intention on the basis of treatment is further exacerbated. A doctor, for instance, is expected to treat a patient for an illness or for pain. If such treatment results in death, then the only question which can normally arise from that patient's death is one of proportionality. Was the treatment proportionate to the illness and pain of the patient, and were the risks associated with its use justified as an acceptable risk? That is a judgment which on a daily basis rests solely with the doctor, and as such the possible unintended effect of the death of a patient cannot reasonably or practically be considered as murder. As regards the nature of a pre-existing condition, the doctor is the superintending factor in determining the condition, its diagnosis and treatment. Even if treatment is subsequently found to be inadequate or inappropriate, its worst effect can be considered to be medical negligence. The trial had the effect of establishing the legal principle of double effect, in which a doctor treating a seriously ill patient who inadvertently shortens a patient's life cannot be guilty of murder. The tale of Dr. Adams told by the 1957 trial and by the 2003 unsealed papers is a unique horror story. It reveals the complicity of establishment, government, the judiciary and the police in covering the tracks of a serial killer because of unwanted effects it would have on individuals, 
on the institutions they served and on society. Dr. John Bodkin Adams has a unique distinction. He not only got away with murder, he was almost certainly Britain's most successful serial killer. After the trial, Adams was convicted of numerous offences of forging prescriptions, of making false statements on cremation forms, and he was fined almost £3,000. He was subsequently struck off the medical register by the GMC in late 1957. The press and the public were outraged by the acquittal of Adams, even though they were unaware of the full extent of his activities, because rumours in Eastbourne and beyond had cast a long shadow over his practices. Newsweek magazine suggested that Adams was responsible for the deaths of some 400 people. Adams sued for libel, and after a trial presided over by none other than Lord Chief Justice Goddard himself, he became even wealthier as a result. In 1961, just four years after his trial and disbarrel, Adams successfully applied to be reinstated on the medical register as a GP, and he recommenced his practice. He tried to emigrate to the US in 1962, but was refused a visa. He continued his practice in Eastbourne, and to receive bequests from his patients in their wills. He was a man whom no one could touch. He became president of the Clay Pigeon Shooting Association of Great Britain, and while shooting on the 30th of June 1983, he fell and broke his hip, and was taken to Eastbourne Hospital, where he died four days later on the 4th of July, 1983. He was 84 years old.